Hey, good morning. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to like this uh, preaching two times because uh, I'm, all, the, all the mistakes I made in the first hour, they're worked out, so you're going to get the premium stuff. Can I hear an amen? Chuck, Chuck White asked me coming down the hall, he said, hey, uh, are, man, you're so old, are you going to be able to preach two times? I said, man, you're forgetting I was in Albuquerque where we had three services back to back most of the time, and so... This is not anything new for me. Hey, uh, as we kind of gel together, uh, let me just kind of share with you my expectations of you. Uh, and I, I, I'll share the expectations I hope that I can bring to meet what you need. Um, God has laid on my heart some real clear things that I feel like he's called me to share with you. And so I'm going to encourage you to take notes, to have a Bible, to uh, come in and put your whole self uh, in this service and in this time of worship. Um, I expect that of you, nothing less. And here's what you can expect, and I, I hope this would uphold what I think you would expect of me. I'm going to come in here and share what God has led me to share. I'm going to pray and prepare. And uh, today, God's given us some hard-hitting things to share uh, from God's Word, and so I'm going to invite you to turn to Joshua chapter 3, and as you turn there, um, gosh, don't know where I should ask this or not, but I'm going to risk it. How many of you are risk takers? That's <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can see this is going to be a real cool crowd here today. <laughs> um, about a hundred years ago, a guy comes along by the name of Jules Verne. Anybody ever heard of Jules Verne? Everybody 40 and over has raised their hand. Okay, that's cool. Have you ever heard of a book, a movie, or a Disney ride called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea? Can I see your hands on that? We're getting better. He is, I, I was told this week that he is the father of sci-fi. Now, that whole 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea thing is a little bit further back than I go. Here is my generation, Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise. Do I have any connectees there, okay? Do you remember that tagline? It said what? These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. And do you remember what the next statement was? Are y'all really going to make life this tough on me? Boldly go where what? where no man has ever gone before. Well, when you come to Joshua chapter 3, that's exactly what you have. Where no Israelite has ever trod and set a foot since the very spontaneous start of that great nation of God's children with Abram, for the first time, a group of people are going to come back. They are going to return and, and honor God's pledge. And so today, uh, we're going to be looking at the transition and change that these people are about uh, to take uh, into their lives. I, I don't know what it is about people that resist change. We are encouraging our, our students to sit together. That's a very important concept. First of all, youth groups ought to want to be together. That's the first thing you have to... You always worry in a church when, when a youth group won't sit together. That's never a good sign. I want you to understand that. In any church, students should want to be together. Second thing you've got to understand is a young person or young people on a back row or in a balcony is never going to end well. Just like two adolescents in a car in the dark at midnight out in the woods is never going to end well. There's not anything going to good that's going to come from that. And so we've been talking to our students about, hey, we don't care where you sit, but you need to sit together. And it's interesting, it's not just an age thing. We all resist change. What is it that's so difficult for us about change? I mean, the old folks resist change. The youth resist change. And everyone in between resists change. The other day, somebody brought me, they love to do this because I grew up here. They brought me one of those old church directories, 1976. 
And here I was, you know, the little shaved ears. But back then I had hair. Man, I was so thankful for hair. And uh, I, I'm, I'm standing there in front of my parents, you know, got that big grin on. And, and uh, you know, as I was, I said, hey, let me, let me look through this. And now after the embarrassment, of, you know, my youth picture here, let me go back and look. And everyone had on something. Some of you won't remember this. They, everybody in there had on something called leisure suits. John Travolta, uh, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Uh, you know, hey, the shirt's unbuttoned, the silk shirt, the collar folded over the jacket. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm amazed that anyone could be saved during that culture in church. <laughs> I mean, man, that, man, that has to be the ugliest I mean, fashion merchandise ever cranked out. But you know, the truth is, what we're going to talk about today is very important, because change is not easy. Our clothing is changing, our culture is changing, our physical being is changing, our families are changing, people around us are changing, and you and I have got to be able to take some tools into that type of culture and those changes to help us be able to adapt. Somebody brought me an article and slipped it under my door the other day. We, we don't, I mean, we're one of the churches that doesn't have pastoral research assistants. David Dykes, one of my friends at Green Acres, preached his last sermon today. After 30, 30, 31 years, you know, four full-time research assistants. He said, I'm gonna preach on Job in six months. Those four people went to work, brought him all kinds of stuff. My research assistants, people put stuff under my door when they find it that might help. But anyway, someone brought this article in. It's amazing. And uh, I, I never thought about this, but it said, for you that are young people, college students, you are going to change, listen to this, professions at a rate of about 3.2 times in your lifetime. Now, I didn't say you're going to change jobs. I didn't say you're going to go work for this engineering firm and live Eastman. I'm saying, hey, you may start out as a teacher, then, then, then you may go to law school and be a lawyer, and then you may end up in the oil and gas business. Think about that. Three profession changes and a little bit more in the world that we live in. Did you know the average adult will live in at least six different places in their lifetime? On average. Change is around us. And in Joshua chapter 3, as we began reading, I want you to understand a big change is underway. God's children have been wandering for 40 years. 40 years. And there's embarrassment. Nothing is more motivating than when people have to live in defeat for 40 stinking years. It was a new young generation that's coming on a new leader, a rookie leader by the name of Joshua taking over from Moses because every one of these young people's moms and dads that had been rebellious and said, we will not go in 40 years earlier, they are no longer around. There's only two of those adults left and that was the two spies and one of them is now leading the whole nation. Somewhere between two and two and a half million people wandering for 40 years, one funeral after another, moms, dads, Grandparents, aunts, uncles, one by one, this younger generation saw them all die. And they died because of their rebellion. They died because God brought them all the way up to the promised land one time before, sent in 12 spies. And these individuals, there were some things that they came back and, and proclaimed. There's giants over there, number one. The cities, the walls, they're fortified. We can't get through it. Number three, they have iron weapons. We've never seen anything made of iron. I mean, I mean there's no way we can overcome that. And plus, that, plus the fact that, number four, we have no idea what's unknown out there. And so maybe this is not the best time, Moses, for us to go in. And because that they did not trust God's promise, God says, that's fine. We're going to just circle you for 40 long years out here in this desert until every stinking one of you is gone. And then we'll rear up, a, bring up another generation, and by golly, we'll see if they'll go in. 
And so finally, after chapter two of reconnaissance that we looked at last week, the people come to a little river crossing, just a little bitty small village. Archaeologists tell us probably no more than 40 or 50 people live there full time. The little place is called Shittim. And it is on the east side of the Jordan, and they're about to get ready to, to, to cross over east to west. And, and, and in doing so, let's pick up in Joshua chapter number three, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number one. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to Jordan, where they camped, uh, camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to people. Now, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, he said... Uh, uh, the ark of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. And then you will know which way to go. Since you have never been this way before, keep a distance. By the way, that's a very important phrase. You've never been this way before. Never been this way before. Important to remember. Keep, keep, keep reading with me. He says, uh, then, then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before, but keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits. For you mathematics, analytical, for you engineer kind of guys, let's convert it. What's it, 18.9? Not, not quite 19 inches a cubit. That's, oh, 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 that's just a little over 3,000 feet. Oh, 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 that, that's just a hair over a half mile. We got it. There you go. Between you and the ark, and do not what? Get near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do. Now, some of you have a, have a translation that says amazing things. I'm reading from the NIV. Some of you don't have the word amazing. You have wonder or wonderful, things of wonder or wonderful things among you. And Joshua said to the priest, take up the ark, the covenant, and pass on ahead of the people. So they took took it up and they went on ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of Israel so that you may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Now that promise comes back from us from two weeks ago. God's promises are never derailed by time or circumstances. 99.9% .9 of you believe with everything in your heart today that God honored his promises to Moses. But less than half of all believers believe that God will do something amazing in terms of a miracle or substance through a, a life-changing disease. It's so hard for some reason to believe that God's promises are applicable to us in 2021. It's easy in Old Testament. We grew up learning those stories. I remind you that God's promises are never derailed by time or I don't, I don't care how bad it gets. God's promises are always with us. Can I hear you say, look, just a baby amen? Good. Man, y'all are pretty, man, hey, this group's going to be something before the day's out. I want you to know that. Look in verse, uh, uh, look in verse number eight. Tell the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge, of, uh, the edge of Jordan's rivers, go and stand in the river. And Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive you. Uh, drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, uh, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. We added one last week, Chigarbites. Did you get them all? Do I get bonus points for saying all those correctly? Verse 11. Come on, pastor. You're supposed to say them correctly. You're the pastor. See the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. Verse 13 is huge. Look at it. And as soon as the priest who carried the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan. Look at this contingency promise. When they set foot in the Jordan, then its waters flowing downstream will be out, will, will, will be cut off and will stand up in a heap. Now there's an East Texas concept. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan's at flood stage. What a blessing. Of all the times we're going to cross, it's when the river is out of banks. All of, it, it, it's just, if God took Mount Hermon, big blob, about an eight or 9,000 feet, took his finger, dug a deep ravine, and dumped it into the Dead Sea, and that little thing right there called the Jordan River, and that thing is out of its banks. It's in the harvest time. It's in flood stage. Look in the middle of verse 13. Yet as soon as the priest 
who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap and a great distance away. At a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon, the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, well, that's the Dead Sea, it was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite of Jericho, that's gonna be one of their first missions. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of Jordan and stood on dry ground. And while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation that had completed the crossing, they were on dry ground. Can you imagine, I, I, I guess part of my challenge today is just trying to help you understand what these, these two million people knew. They knew that their parents and grandparents had said, hey, there's giants there, there's walls that are impenetrable, there's no way you can get into them. These people have weapons like you've never seen, primarily iron weapons. And you, and you know what, it's, it's, I mean, it would be like attacking them with a pocket knife and they whip out an Uzi. It would just be nuts. That's what they knew from the past. What they knew from that moment is, here they stood in the banks of the Jordan was crazy. It'd be like, do we want to go white water rafting right now? <laughs> Do we really want to do this? Hey, why don't we wait a few weeks? Let the water come down. It won't be a challenge. No one will get drowned. No one will get killed. What are we going to do with this newborn baby? How are we going to carry him or her across? What about mamma over here? She's kind of aged. Well, they all died, didn't they? Got it. What about the infirmed? The challenges. But here's what they didn't know. They didn't know really what it was going to be like when they got into this new land. So today, what I want to do is just toss out three things, and I hope you'll write them down. I think they're going to be very significant to us as you and I face changes. And let me tell you what I'm talking about in terms of changes. Six people in the last 13 days at Oakland Heights Baptist Church have been diagnosed with cancer, brand new diagnoses. Fortunately, all but one of those is like stage one, stage two kind of stuff. Real good possibility that doctors feel like, oncologists feel like, hey, those are probably treatable. One of our older men, hey, that just has a short time to live. So he calls me the other day. Pastor, I got a question for you, okay? My life's about to change. In fact, it looks like my life's about to end. Well, what's the question? The question is, do you think at age 84, I should take treatment? I mean, I'm 84, I've lived a full life. What do you think? About three weeks ago, a young couple comes to me. Pastor, we're thinking about doing our third round of infertility treatment. Hasn't worked the other two, and it's about to bankrupt us. But we sense that God is saying, try again. Should we do that? Whether you're facing treatment or not, big life change. Whether you're thinking about considering the whole parenting thing and the, the plausibility and possibility of that, big changes potentially coming, big ramifications. One of our young adults is thinking about starting a restaurant. We have this conversation. Pastor, what do you think? I have a desire in my heart to do that. And you know, all three of those, I had to come back and tell them the same thing. I don't know. But I follow that with three applications or strides from this text that will help us in any circumstances of change that we may face. And that's what we're doing as a church family. We're taking not just a historical look and a theological look, but we're taking a practical look at changes because we know we're involved in changes. We know that changes are going to continue to come at record pace in our lives, and we better be equipped to handle that. First item I want you to jot down. I want to show it to you from the text. First item, when you and I are facing change, we have got to look to God's provision. We have got to be able to look to God's provision. 
Now just think about this for a moment. I jotted down three little things there and I want you to write them down with me. We know out of God's provision, first of all, God will guide us. Number one, write it down, God will guide us in whatever we face. This senior adult gentleman that says, should I take the treatment? I don't know. But here's what I know, God will clearly guide you in that decision. To the gentleman that says, should I open a restaurant? I don't know. But here's what I know. God's promises are never hindered by time or circumstance, so I know God's going to guide you in that. How do you handle that? To a young couple, I had to look squarely in the eyes to them and say, hey, I know I'm your pastor, and I'll pray. Look, hey, man, we prayed right there on the spot. But here, hey... I, I don't know where you are in your relationship. I don't know where you are exactly in your finances. I don't know where you are in your Christian walk individually. I don't know how, how tight you're yoked here together. I don't know how big a deal this is to you emotionally. I just don't know those things. I don't know all the peripheral things. But here's what I do know. God will guide you. Our young people will never talk about this. But many of them right now are waging a war inside of themselves morally about where the sexual boundaries are going to be in their lives. And it's a challenge. They're too embarrassed to talk to that, to a Sunday school, to a small group leader. Most of them would never talk to their parents, and they're certainly not going to talk to their pastor about it. But in the midst of those body changes and those Big, big decisions. Those are huge decisions. Whether before marriage I'm going to engage in sexual activity or not is a huge choice. And there I can say with assurance what the right thing and the wrong thing to do is. And I know that God will guide. Will every young person be obedient to God's leadership? Historically, absolutely not. But we do know that God will guide, don't we? Whether or not we reject that, I don't know. Can you imagine two million people standing up there on the bay, never been over there, Joshua, rookie, Moses experience, now Joshua's in charge, never led people, just a military guy, done, done, done pretty well, evidently didn't have much of a personality. I look around the bank, you scan the bank in the Bible, that mention John Wayne and any Indian guides up there. They're going to have to figure it out. I got good news for them. God's going to guide. But see, the provision is more than just God guiding. It is this whole concept of God providing. Write that down. God is going to provide. For the young couple, if this is what God guides you to do, he's going to make provisions for that financially. I don't know how it's going to happen. God just does those kind of things. Now, if you go outside of the mode of what he desires for you, you do that at peril of your own financial being. <laughs> but if you know and you're being called to do that, then God's going to, to, to provide retired military general about 15, 16 years ago wrote a whole book on this about just the logistics of people wandering for 40 years, somewhere between two and three million Jewish people. Have you ever thought about, he says, if they ate as Americans do today, it would take 4,000 tons of food a day to feed them. But he said in the Middle East like that at that time, about 1,500 tons of food to feed these people for one day. Now, you tell me that's not a miracle. Hey, if that doesn't go far enough, can you imagine 1,800? He said it would take 1,800 railroad cars with huge containers to bring in enough water to these people in the desert for one day. Have you ever stopped to think about the incredible provision, how God provides for his people? And a third thing I want you to jot down is as God provides for us, you'll always get a sense of God's goodness. Over in Deuteronomy, God's goodness. Over in Deuteronomy, it's hard for me even to share this without thinking about Deuteronomy chapter eight and verse number two. I, I, I just wanna read it real, I'll, I'll be through reading it before you get there, but Deuteronomy eight two says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way into the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order it's just a summary of what God's done in, their, in, in the wilderness wandering in, in order to test you so that he'll know about your heart 
In verse 3 in Deuteronomy uh, 8, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but, 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 but what? Every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now listen to this, verse 4. Your clothes did not wear out. Can you believe that? 40 years and your clothes didn't wear out. And your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Wow. Know then that your heart, that as in your heart, that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Man, you talk about, you guys that are here, you talk about God's goodness. Can you imagine your wife not having to go Dillard's to shoe shop for 40 years? Now, is that a blessing or what? Is that God's goodness or what? Absolutely. Think about this. We don't need 617 Jewish cobblers to fix shoes. The shoes all held up for 40 years and people's feet didn't change. No bunions shot out where the shoe didn't fit on there anymore. The feet, people's feet didn't swell. I mean, can you, I mean, here we got a physician assistant, right? Probably half of what Miss Rashida looks like, I mean, looks at every day is people's feet and legs that are swollen. Amen or not? A bunch of it. Yes, yeah, okay. But can you imagine that? Going through all that, that wilderness stuff was not fun. But in the midst of it, God's goodness. Have you ever stopped to think about during the day a big class? I mean, these people didn't know where to go. Joshua, Moses trying to lead. I mean, those guys weren't experts in the desert wandering. Yes, Moses nomadic. Moses had done some wandering, but to lead millions of people, I mean, I mean, there is no book and primer for that. And so God, what? He brings a cloud. How would it be in 126 degree weather for a cloud to come over and break the sun rays off of you? What a blessing. And at night... When the desert gets ice cold on the surface of the ground, somebody the other day was talking, we had a bunch of pool parties in our church the last couple of weeks, and somebody was talking about pool heaters. And I said, man, we had to run a heater for 12 years in Albuquerque. You had to heat your pool in the summer. They said, man, out there in the Southwest, it gets hot. And I said, yeah, but it gets cold at night. Cold enough for the old camel's teeth to chatter. But at night... A column of fire. Think about that. Dark, dark in the middle of nowhere. And this glow and illumination from this very column. And the warmth that came from it. I'm telling you, God's goodness will always be a part of his provision. So did you get that first element? God's going to provide for you. He is going to provide. He's going to make provision. Second thing I want you to jot down. And man, this is huge. We've got to be able to pay attention in these moments of change. You and I have got to be able to pay attention to God's location. Now, Mia's one of my favorite students. What's up, Mia? What's up? And uh, she's one of my favorites. And uh, Mia, sometimes when, you, when you're talking or teaching, Mia may act like she's not listening. And she always has a smile on her face. She's awesome. But sometimes after the service, she'll come up and it was just like from nowhere, she'll hit you with this question. So before Mia hits me with this question, when I say, Mia, hey, we got to pay attention to God's location, Mia's probably going to ask me after the service today, if I don't explain this, wait, 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 pastor. I thought God was omnipresent. In other words, my small group leader pastor taught me that God is what? Everywhere. And we know that's true. So pastor, what, what's up here with this pay attention to God's location? Well, go back and, and look. If, if you scan this chapter 10 times, you're going to see the central point of, Je of Joshua 3. You know what the center point is? The Ark of the Covenant. 10 times the Ark of the Covenant is brought before us over and over and over and over. And what's the big deal? God says, I want the Ark of the Covenant. Engineers, you're on top of it. A little over 300 feet, a little over half a mile. You got it. Out in front of us. Hey, dude, that's two laps around the track, straightened out. That's way out there. 
Why would God want the Ark of the Covenant, the location of his covenant, that far out? And see, the Bible answers that for us. You go back there and you, and you look in verse 4 and following, and it's very clear that God says, hey, because you have not what? You, not have, you have not passed this way. I'm listening. Pass this way what? Before. Now, some would say, well, it's about holiness. You can't get too close to the ark. You die. We know in the Bible, some people have touched the covenant, the ark of the covenant, and that didn't bode well. They, oop, graveyard dead. And No, it, it wasn't so much a holy, reverent thing. It was a sightline thing. It was a positioning concept. You understand the ark, don't you? Four and a half feet wide, two and a half feet this way, depth, uh, deep in terms of the box, two and a half more feet. We know that at least three things in there. We know the tablets are in there, what Moses drug down from the mount. We know that what Aaron's rod was in there. And we also know there was at least one other object, a golden bowl of manna in there. Acacia wood handles, the big cherubim, the solid, we don't know how thick, but evidently pretty substantial, solid gold top. Solid gold on top. And the people lugged that dude around 40 years in the desert. All right, we're moving. They'd pick that dude up and haul it. That thing has been with them all over the desert. Now, all of a sudden, something changes. God says, I'm going to tell you something. I want that ark out in that water a half of a mile. I want every one of these tribes, two plus million people, to be able to see it. And if you put it too close to the group, everybody won't be able to see it. You got to get it out there a ways. He didn't say like East Texas, hey, just put it out there somewhere. No, 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 no. Just a little over a half mile. I want it 2,000 cubits, a little over 3,000 feet. That's exactly where I want it. Do you see the importance of this principle? The location you got to give attention to God's location. Now, write two words down. we got to hurry. Two words. Possession and position. Somewhere out in, the, in white space there. Possession and position. You see, way too many Christians... We know that when you become a believer, God indwells you. The Bible teaches us that. He is a part of who you are, your very soul, your nephesh, your spirit. He indwells you. He is there, and you're not going to get him out. You can go back, you're not going to pluck him out of the hand. I mean, there's all kinds of promises and assurances that when you're a real believer, you are a believer for the rest of your entire life. Ride right down the street, take a right right there at Bramlett School. There's a little church on the corner. They're going to tell you, no, you can lose your salvation. You got to be baptized 116 times or whatever it takes. But hey, every time you sin, you lose your salvation. You lose it, you get it. You lose it, you get it. You lose it. I can't keep up with that. I'm just thankful that the Bible says, hey, when you're a believer, you're always a believer. God will never surrender one of his children. Say amen. But what most of us do, is we treat God as he indwells us as just a possession. Most of us are living lives that are defeated because here's how we treat God. We get in our vehicle and it's as if God, hey, God goes with us every day. He just rides over there in the passenger seat. Now we're driving. <laughs> we're conducting our business. God just as a possession, rides with us. He possesses us. We're in possession of him. So he just accompanies us. And you're always doomed to defeat there. But when we move from this possession concept and put God in a different position in our lives, now all of a sudden everything changes. We all go down to the bank. We're thinking about whitewater rafting, and we look out there a half mile out there, and here's these priestly garments floating up in the water, and they're trying to keep the ark dry, holding those handles of acacia wood, and everybody can see it. And the Bible says in Joshua 3, you keep your what? You keep your eye on it. 
all of a sudden, God's just not some possession that indwells us. But all of a sudden, he's in a whole different position. Now he's leading us. Mr. So-and-so, I can't help you at age 84 to tell you whether or not to take tree. I know God's going to guide you, but let me tell you something else. Can I give you some pastoral advice? Here it is. Right now, you need to be sure where God's position is in your life. Are you going to tell him over in the pastures you see what you're going to do? Or are you going to allow him to be in a position in your life right now that he's going to tell you? Young couple, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe adoption is what God's saying. Maybe you're tired of trying the traditional pregnancy. Maybe you're tired of the expensive fertility treatments. But I can't tell you what to do. But here's what I can tell you. God will guide. And number two, you better be very careful about the location of who God is in your life and where he is right now in your walk with him. Two very important things. God's going to guide you. And God, our attention has got to be on his location in our lives. Number three, and we finish. Carefully trust in God's instruction. Carefully trust in God's instruction. I want you to see this. Go back to verse number eight. The Bible says at the end of verse number eight, I want you to go and stand in the river. I want you to see these action words. I mentioned to you when we read how important verse 13 was. As soon as the priest who carried the ark of the Lord set foot into Jordan, action words. Then, contingent, he says, then its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and will stand up in a what? In a heap. I mentioned a few moments ago that some of you have the translation. Can you imagine? I was just taken back this morning. I... My alarm went off at 3.58. I got to be honest, that's a.m. I hit snooze one time. Sorry, Mia. Slip in this morning, 4.09, 4.08, I, I crawled out of the sack. And as I'm sitting there in this little barn house on our little farm, and I'm just praying and I'm finishing up some things of what I feel like God's leading me. It's, it, it's one of the few times it's quiet. With four dogs in the house, it was quiet for just a moment. I don't know if the dogs make more racket or the wife. Anyway, I don't know, but I'm, I'm just kidding, Becky, just kidding. Um, can you imagine if I was praying this morning, 4.30-ish, and all of a sudden as I was listening to God, God says, hey, hey, hey. Today, get ready. Consecrate yourself. I'm going to do some amazing things. That, I don't know how I would feel about that. It's interesting here in the Hebrew language, whether you see the word wonder, wonderful, or amaze, or amazement, the Hebrew word doesn't change. That Hebrew word is the same all the way through. It means you can't figure out, you can't understand, you cannot do. And so the instruction they're getting there is this incredible language. That I'm about to do some things that you can't do, that you're not going to be able to figure out. This flowing water that's such an issue for you, I created. I'm the God of this entire creation. I'll take care of that. You get that ark out there where everybody can see it. Put it in the position, the location where it needs to be. And you watch what I do. But did you notice it's not going to happen unless what? Unless these leaders wade down into the water. We had a group of young adults out this weekend, had a great time with them, and one of them shared this statement. They said, Pastor, <laughs> we think it'd be cool. You've got this big pond down here at your house. Why don't we have an Old Testament, I mean an old-time baptismal service in the pond? And I didn't have the heart to tell them about the size of the water moccasins that we have. But I did, I did communicate to them, hey, that might not be a good thing. Baptism would be a great thing, but not in the pond, in the pastor's pond. The pond's 30 feet deep. They said, how deep? I said, 30 feet. 
Now that would be true immersion, amen? True immersion. <laughs> and they said, well, great. You don't have to go to the middle where it's the deepest. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Two steps, woo, you're gone, baby. I said, it might have to be a Methodist baptism up there in the six inch shallows, you know, a little drizzling going on up there. But have you ever stopped to think about the banks of the Jordan? Not this way, this way. And they're out of the banks. As we walk out of here, I am moved today because so many believers come to these crossings of their lives and they're so ill-equipped to handle it. You see, that third and final thing, we've got to tr carefully trust in God's instruction. We've got to carefully trust exactly what he says, every part of it, every element of it. Do exactly what he says to do and he will guide us. And he, as we put him in the right position in our lives, he will do all that he needs to do when we follow his instruction. Did, did you notice that it all depends on action? And that door of action of faith opens up all kinds of poss possibilities. You know what I can't walk away from today? The Ark of the Covenant. How many people there are that are always waiting in their Christian life for God to bring them something new? Some kind of new gadget. Some kind of new start. Americans love January 1st. New start. Health clubs are filled for about three weeks. And then back down to what they always are. We are filled with new beginnings. We're always thinking in our Christian life, many of us are living, even today, defeated lives. Lives that are not victorious. We're struggling with all these changes, all the crazy things we're dealing with. And, and we're wondering, you know, well, hey, God's got, surely God's going to do something fresh, different, new. Maybe he's going to bring me a new possession, a new thing. And isn't it amazing that the very thing that the Israelites had in their possession the whole time. Ten times was mentioned to us in the crossing as the central object of success. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament represented the presence of God. And for you and for me, I want to invite you today the starting point for you and for me in this victorious Christian life is not enough anything new. For many of us that already know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's that very element of Jesus himself that's with us all of this time that is the catalyst for the first step in victory. But he's got to be put in the position where we focus on him, recognize him, worship him. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, I just look around this room and overwhelmed that a couple of our college students here, hey, Monday morning, big dorm meeting tonight for them over at ETBU, 9.30, mandatory, start of a new semester. I think about the challenges that are in front of them. I look down here at our students, many that are already started in their school, some that are getting kicked off this week, and I look at the challenges in front of them, the schedules, the challenges of all the different elements that they're facing, their bodies are changing, their lives are just filled with stress. I look at across this room, I see four or five brand new babies. I love those new babies. And I, I've just watched and witnessed you one young couple after another and how much change and transformation and transition begins to take place when that first baby comes along and sometimes that second and sometimes that third or fourth. Think about some of the moms and dads that are here today and they're struggling with this concept of adolescenthood and how to be the parent that they need to be and the changes that that's bringing. 
Father, I look around at the marriages that are here. So many that are not investing in the maintenance portion that is necessary for a marriage to go the distance. When we don't take care of the maintenance in our ministry, the date nights, the time, the investment, marriages very seldom ever end well. And Father, I, I just pray for the many needs across this room. We all are facing change at this fast, rapid rate. And so, Father, as we take these principles with us, we know they're timeless. We know they have withstood the test of pressure and time in one life after another. Our God will make provision for us. Our God needs to be placed the full attention of his location in our life. That needs to be at a premier place where every day we're not looking at the rushing waters of a river, but our focus, our eyes are solely on the covenant. In this case, it was the ark. For us as New Testament believers, it's Jesus Christ himself. Father, we know in our Bibles when people took their eyes off of you, I think about a young man that was out in the middle of a stormy sea, out there with the Lord, and he was standing and sustained out on the water itself of all things. But the moment he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. So Father, with that in mind, we heed your instruction today. That principle to heed your word exactly as you proclaim it to us. Even in the midst of culture, when everyone else is, and the Bible says don't, we will heed your word and do exactly as you tell us. So Father, as we move along through this series in Joshua, I pray that you would continue to use your word. Speak into our hearts, change us, equip us, stride by stride and step by step. And these things we pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. God bless you.